Clinton, Louisiana, Monday, June 26, 2000. Deputy Sheriff Ronald Johnson recognized the smell of death as soon as he stepped into the house. It grew stronger in the kitchen and became unbearable as he edged toward the master bedroom. As soon as Johnson peeked into the bedroom, he saw the body. It lay sprawled on the floor, naked, bloody. Johnson bolted from the house. The smell gagged him, and he threw up near his patrol car. Then he called the dispatcher and told her what he'd found. It was 10.30 in the morning. Detective Don McKee arrived at the scene at 10.48 a.m. The two-story wood frame house sat near the end of a gravel road on several acres of land in rural East Feliciana Parish. It belonged to 42-year-old Nora Jane Guillory, Janor to her friends and family. Although Janor had lived by herself since the death of her longtime boyfriend two years before, she wasn't completely alone. She shared the property with 30 dogs that she kept kenneled behind her house. Janor loved dogs. She also loved horses. She had four of them stabled on U.S. Highway 61, not too far from her home. A personnel specialist for a big insurance company in Baton Rouge. Janor's office was 60 miles away, but she didn't mind the drive. Her co-workers were almost like family. Everyone at work loved Janor. She was a happy person and generous to a fault. Pauline Petrie worked with Janor for 10 years. Their desks stood just 10 feet apart. She was kind, gentle, compassionate, and generous, Mrs. Petra said. She was a wonderful person. Linda Saneo worked with her for 11 years. Janor was the most generous person I've ever known, she said. Janor had taken a half day off on Friday to do some work around her house. Her friends got concerned when she didn't come into the office Monday morning. It wasn't like her not to show up for work, and it certainly wasn't like her not to call. A co-worker dialed her cell phone and got no answer. A call to her home phone was answered with a busy signal. The operator said there was no activity on the line. The phone was off the hook. Janor's friends got scared. They called the East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Department. Less than an hour after Janor's friends made that call, Detective Don McKee was investigating her murder. The side door to the house stood open. It had been open when Deputy Johnson first arrived. A snarling black and tan chow was tied to the wooden steps just outside the door. There was no sign of forced entry. Just across the threshold, McKee found blood on the hardwood floor. Blood was also spattered on the inside handle of the front door and on a set of keys hanging from the deadbolt. In the kitchen, a utensil drawer had been pulled open. Some of the knives inside had blood on them. It looked to McKee like someone had attacked Janor at the side door, then pursued her to the front door where she tried to escape, then into the kitchen where she'd attempted to arm herself with a knife, then finally into the bedroom. That's where all hell broke loose, McKee said. The detective found Janor's mangled body crumpled on the floor beside her bed. Her skull had been caved in. Small caliber bullets and a knife had left jagged holes in her skin. The insides of her thighs were smeared with blood. The bedroom was a wreck. A bullet had shattered a window pane beside the four-poster bed, and another had punched a hole through the headboard. A third bullet was buried in the wall. A heavy ceramic lamp lay broken in pieces by Janor's head, and a table stood upended nearby. Someone had left a bloody shoe print on one of the pillowcases. You could see the blood smears on the wall, McKee said. As Monday morning slipped into Monday afternoon, a small crowd gathered at Janor's house. Several friends from work had come from Baton Rouge, and members of Janor's family had driven in from Opelousas, Louisiana. Her neighbors Philip and Amy Skipper were there also. Philip was 23. He and his wife Amy had a baby boy, and they also had custody of a 15-year-old named John Balio. Balio had lived with the Skippers for about two years. The four of them lived in a trailer across the road from Janor. The Skippers were dirt poor. Janor had practically adopted the young couple and their baby. She hired Philip and John Balio to help her take care of her dogs and horses and mow the grass on her property. She paid Amy to clean her house. Janor even picked up the tab for a birthday party at a local pizza joint for the Skippers' son. Because the Skippers didn't have a telephone, 
Janor gave Amy a key to her house so that they could use her phone whenever they needed it. It was an unusual relationship. A middle-aged black woman and a young white couple in a parish where a Confederate soldier statue still stands guard in front of the courthouse, but it seemed to work well. Janor's family asked Philip and Amy Skipper if they would do their best to clean up her house. The Skippers agreed. Janor Guillory had a stalker. East Feliciana detectives learned that a newly hired 45-year-old Baton Rouge police officer had been calling Janor at work, sometimes two or three times a day. Janor had gone on a lunch date with the officer once, but had broken off contact with them almost immediately afterward. According to one of her co-workers, Janor said the officer wouldn't keep his hands off her during lunch. The officer's repeated phone calls got so annoying that Janor asked her friends at work to tell her would-be Romeo that she wasn't in. After it became clear that Janor wouldn't answer his calls, the officer showed up at her house. She was polite but firm. She wasn't interested. But he wouldn't take no for an answer. One evening, Janor's unwanted suitor sneaked up on her while she was feeding her horses. His unexpected appearance frightened her. He also frequently lurked in the parking lot outside Janor's office, waiting for her to come out. The Friday before Janor's murder, the officer left her a message that he would stop by her house Saturday on his way to visit his mother in nearby St. Francisville. Detective McKee asked the Baton Rouge police officer to take a polygraph test two weeks later. He flunked. When McKee tried to question the officer further, the policeman asked for an attorney. Because his suspect lived in Baton Rouge, Don McKee sought help from the Baton Rouge Police Department and the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Department. Both agencies agreed to cooperate. McKee and a team of investigators searched the officer's house and combed through his two personal cars and his police cruiser. They were looking for a 22 caliber pistol, knives, a shoe to match the bloody footprint found at the crime scene, and trace evidence, blood, hair, or fibers, linking the officer to Janor's murder. They found nothing. On July 20, 2000, the Baton Rouge newspaper The Advocate ran a story under the headline, Police Officer Suspected in Slaying. Back in Clinton, Detective Don McKee ran out of leads. The case went cold, he said. A year dragged on. Don McKee picked up new cases. A local drug dealer was ambushed and shot dead at a bar. Another man was murdered in his home. A two-year-old boy disappeared. A thug named One-Eyed Boo was kidnapped and killed. Still, the Guillory case tugged at McKee. Images of Janor were burned into his brain. He couldn't forget her or what had been done to her. McKee poked around in Janor's past in his spare time looking for skeletons. Skeletons led to motives. Motives led to suspects. He got nowhere. I couldn't find one bad thing about this woman, McKee said. The break he needed, the break he'd been waiting for, came late on a Friday afternoon, July 27, 2001. It came from two parishes over. A detective from the Tangapahoa Parish Sheriff's Office called. Was McKee investigating a year-old homicide involving a female victim who'd been shot, stabbed, and beaten? McKee, East Feliciana Sheriff Talmadge Bunch, and Detective Joel Odom jumped in a car and raced to Tangapahoa Parish. What the Tangapahoa cops had was a 23-year-old girl whose boyfriend was abusive. While she was filing a complaint against him for the beating he'd given her, she mentioned to the Tangapahoa deputies that he had information about the murder of a lady in Clinton, a lady everyone called Ms. G. McKee and Odom caught up with Donnie Fisher's boyfriend and braced him. Fisher was a 26-year-old doper, thief, and convicted armed robber. He knew the game and didn't want to talk. McKee shuffled through the crime scene photos and picked out the most gruesome ones. Snapshots of Janor Guillory sprawled on the floor, thighs smeared with blood, head crushed beyond recognition. McKee spread the pictures on a table in front of Fisher and pounded them with his fist. Did she deserve this? He shouted. Donnie Fisher told the detectives that he and his girlfriend had moved in with Philip and Amy Skipper right after the murder. Janor's family was still trying to get her house cleaned up. They hired Philip Skipper, Donnie Fisher, and 15-year-old John Balio, whom Philip referred to as a stepson, to help. While they were inside Janor's house, Balio told Fisher that he and Philip Skipper and a guy named Johnny Hoyt had killed Janor Guillory. 
Balio even described how they did it. He said they shot her, stabbed her, and beat her with a baseball bat. Then they took turns raping her. Fisher told the detectives that later that night, after they were done working at Janor's house, Philip Skipper got pissed at Balio for spilling the beans about the murder. Philip took Fisher for a ride in his pickup truck the next day. They stopped on a deserted gravel road. Fisher was sure that Philip was going to kill him on the spot. Instead, Philip confirmed John Balio's story. What would you think if I told you we killed Ms. G? Philip said. I wouldn't think nothing, Fisher said. You wouldn't trust me no more. Philip stopped the truck and stared at him. Why wouldn't I trust you? The prospect of death again loomed large in Fisher's mind. He knew Philip kept a gun in his truck. You ain't gonna kill me, huh? He asked. Philip shook his head. But if you ever say anything about it to anybody, just remember, God forgives, the Brotherhood doesn't. Means, opportunity, motive. Three things a good homicide investigator wants to know. Philip Skipper had the means and the opportunity to kill Janor Guillory. He had access to guns, knives, and probably a baseball bat lying around his trailer somewhere. He lived across the street from her. His wife even had a key to her house. But why? On the surface, it didn't make sense. The Skippers were Janor's neighbors. They were her friends. At least, they had been, until the incident with the goat. Early in his investigation, McKee learned that a rift had opened between Janor and the Skippers a month or so before her death. Philip had a thing for pit bulls, and Janor had been keeping one of his dogs in a kennel. One day, the dog broke out and killed a goat that belonged to the Skippers. Amy had been furious. She stormed over to Janor's house to use the phone. She called Janor at work, shouting and cursing at her. The call so upset Janor that she started crying. One of her co-workers heard Janor tell Amy to leave the key on the kitchen counter and get out of her house. Janor told friends at work that she'd had enough of the skippers and were severing all ties with them. McKee wondered if a dead goat was enough reason for Philip Skipper to commit murder. Then Donnie Fisher told McKee about Janor's $25,000 life insurance policy. She'd named Philip and Amy Skipper as the beneficiaries. According to Fisher, after Janor's death, Philip had been mad about the amount of the death benefit. He'd been expecting a lot more. She told him that it had been $100,000, Fisher said. That's what he was expecting. Now, McKee had a motive. McKee and a team of detectives and state troopers served search and arrest warrants at the Skipper's trailer on August 8, 2001, more than a year after Janor's murder. They found several knives, two baseball bats, a few rounds of 22 caliber ammunition, and some spent shell casings. Mark arrested Philip Skipper for the first-degree murder of Janor Guillory. A few days later, McKee tracked Balio down in Tangapahoa Parish. He'd gone to stay at a friend's trailer when things got too hot at the Skipper's place. Balio was standing outside in the yard when the cops came for him. He ran into the woods, but came out 30 minutes later after the Tangapahoa deputies brought out dogs. Johnny Hoyt was even easier to find. He was serving time at the federal prison in Oakdale, Louisiana. Three months after Janor's murder, sheriff's detectives in neighboring St. Helena Parish caught Hoyt with three sawed-off shotguns. Hoyt was a piece of work. Just 22 years old at the time of Janor Guillory's murder, he already had a string of arrests for aggravated battery and assault. Hoyt wore his hair close-cropped, shaved almost to the scalp, a ragged goatee tapered to a point two inches below his chin. He was also the founder of a fledgling skinhead gang called The Brotherhood. Philip Skipper and John Balio were two of the gang's original members. All three had the letters GFBD tattooed across their backs. The letters stood for God forgives, The Brotherhood doesn't. It was a warning to those who might cross Johnny Hoyt and his friends. It was the same warning Donnie Fisher got after he found out the three of them had killed Janor Guillory. Almost everyone who knew Johnny Hoyt was scared of him. Detective McKee thinks he knows why. Tell me he doesn't look like the devil, McKee said as he pointed to a booking photo of Hoyt. You can see the devil in his face. John Balio was scared of Hoyt and Philip Skipper, but after a weekend in jail, he decided to do something about it. He decided to talk. 
When John Balio was 13, his mother put him into the custody of Philip Skipper. Balio had just finished a stint in a juvenile prison for burglary, and his mother found him uncontrollable. The sexual abuse and beatings at the hands of Philip Skipper started almost immediately. Skipper burned Balio with cigarettes and hot nails. He often held a knife to Balio's throat or a gun to his head and forced the teenager to perform oral sex. He's a crazy, psycho son of a bitch, Balio said. The weekend of Janor Guillory's murder, Philip and Balio drove Philip's pickup truck to the town of Holden, about 40 miles southeast of Clinton, to pick up Johnny Hoyt and his wife, Lisa Skipper Hoyt. Lisa was also Philip's sister. On the trip back to Clinton, Hoyt and Balio rode in the back of the truck. Everyone was throwing down shots of booze and popping Valium, Balio said. Johnny Hoyt started firing a 22 caliber revolver into the air. He looked at Balio and said, Would you like to kill a nigger? When they reached the skipper's trailer, Balio tumbled out of the back of the truck. He threw up and then passed out on the skipper's sofa. I was drunk, he said. Around one o'clock in the morning, Johnny Hoyt woke Balio up and handed him a rope. It's time for you to earn that tattoo on your back, Hoyt said. Take your shoes off so you don't leave no footprints and let's go. Hoyt carried the 22 caliber revolver he'd been firing from the back of Philip's truck. Lisa sat across the room, rolling a blunt. Philip strolled in, carrying an aluminum McGregor baseball bat. Hoyt was the only one wearing shoes. He'd slipped on a pair of white high-top sneakers that belonged to Philip and Lisa's mom. The four of them left the skipper's trailer and crept across the gravel road to Janor Guillory's house. It was time to commit a murder. It was supposed to be my initiation into the Brotherhood, Balio said. Lisa knocked on the side door of Janor's house. Philip, John Hoyt, and John Balio crouched in the darkness, just out of sight. Janor opened the door. She wore a long blue nightshirt. Cleo, her black and tan chow, stood at her side. The dog could be vicious. Janor counted on it for protection. Lisa asked to borrow some money so she could buy diapers for her baby. Janor stared at her neighbor for a second. Okay, Janor said, but before she could turn to go back into the house for the money, Johnny Hoyt sprang up and slammed his fist into her face. The dog leapt at Hoyt, but before the chow got its teeth into him, Balio grabbed the thick mane around the dog's head with one hand and slipped a loop of rope around its neck with the other. Janor fled into the house. She tried to escape through the front door, but it was locked. Hoyt hit her again as she struggled with a set of keys that hung from the deadbolt. She ran into the kitchen, leaving her blood smeared across the front door handle and the keys. On the kitchen wall hung an old-fashioned wooden phone. Janor lunged for the handset, but Hoyt knocked it away from her. She ripped open a kitchen utensil drawer. Her fingers found a knife, but she couldn't hold on to it as Hoyt continued to beat her. Reeling from the relentless attack, Janor staggered into her bedroom, her last sanctuary. Hoyt, Philip, Lisa, and Balio, who dragged the dog by the neck, pursued her. In the bedroom, Janor snatched the telephone from the nightstand. Someone, Balio said Lisa got the gun from Hoyt, started shooting. The phone was in Janor's left hand, up near her head. One bullet blew completely through the ring finger of her left hand. Another buried itself just below her wrist. A third struck her left arm. Lisa lunged at her with a knife. She plunged the blade into the left side of Janor's body five times, into her chest and stomach. The knife bit hard, leaving wounds six to seven inches deep. One penetrated the base of her left lung. Still, Janor wouldn't fall. She must have known, even in her terror, that to go down meant to die. So they crushed her face with a ceramic lamp and beat her to death with a baseball bat. She fought all the way to the end, Balio said. I can still hear that woman screaming. Then they raped her. There are conflicting stories about the non-consensual sex part. Balio said he just held the dog while Philip and Johnny Hoyt took turns raping Janor. He said they wore condoms. Lisa cackled while her husband and her brother raped her dead neighbor. Philip Skipper once bragged to a friend that he had paid a black man to ejaculate into a cup and that he injected the semen into Janor to throw the cops off. On their way out, the four murderers grabbed what jewelry they could 
and left the chow tied to the steps by the side door. Then they went back to the skipper's trailer to get drunk and get high. After a 14-month investigation, Detective Don McKee had four suspects in custody. Johnny Hoyt, Philip Skipper, and 16-year-old John Balio were indicted for first-degree murder, aggravated burglary, and aggravated rape. Philip Skipper was also charged with the repeated aggravated non-consensual sex of John Balio, who had been in his custody for three years. A grand jury also indicted Lisa Hoyt for first-degree murder. Lisa's involvement in the brutal murder of Janor Guillory surprised even hardened investigators at first. But later, after he learned more about her, Sheriff Talmadge Bunch changed his mind about Lisa. That's an evil, evil girl, the sheriff said. She comes from an evil family. McKee kept digging. He soon uncovered even more gruesome details about the four killers. Less than two weeks after Janor Guillory's murder, a dope dealer in St. Helena Parish, a guy with a habit of flashing wads of cash, had been shot in the head on a gravel road. Someone then set the dope dealer and his pickup truck on fire. Just after the murder, Lisa Hoyt told friends that she was the one who had shot the dealer in the head. Her husband had just helped to burn the body. Balio said Hoyt told him about the murder before it happened. He mentioned it when he came to pick up a gun from Philip Skipper's trailer. The four of them also dabbled in grave robbing. They broke into coffins and stole jewelry, watches, and gold teeth from the bodies of the dead. It was dirty work. Balio remembers prying off the lid of one coffin and spotting a nice ring. When I pulled the ring off, the finger came off with it, he said. Lisa bragged to a friend that the antique watch she wore was from a grave. Sheriff Bunch has nothing but contempt for the whole group. They were taking people's teeth and making necklaces out of them, he said. The lab results were disappointing. There were no identifiable fingerprints at the crime scene. The McGregor baseball bat McKee found at Philip Skipper's trailer had been outside for a year. The rain had long since washed away any DNA evidence that might have been on it. The gun used to shoot Janor had been a revolver. There were no shell casings from the crime scene to compare to those found dumped in Philip Skipper's yard. According to Balio, the gun itself had been broken into pieces and tossed into the Amite River. The bloody clothes and high-top sneakers had been burned. Hoyt, Philip, and Lisa refused to talk. The life insurance policy, which did pay out $25,000 to Philip and Amy Skipper three months after the murder, was circumstantial evidence at best. The second and third hand accounts from people who came forward to say they heard Philip and the others admit to killing Janor Guillory were just hearsay. The only thing we had was John Balio's statement, Don McKee said. The cops still wanted to take the case to trial. District Attorney Charles Shropshire didn't. Not with just the unsupported confession of a teenage drug addict, grave robber, and murderer. In January 2002, four months after their arrests, Shropshire dropped all charges against Hoyt, Philip, and Lisa. Because Balio had confessed to the murder, the DA left him in jail. Later that year, voters in East Feliciana voted Shropshire out of the office and put in a young, aggressive new district attorney named Sam Dakia. Before Dakia's election, Sheriff Talmadge Bunch extracted a promise from the aspiring district attorney that he would take a fresh look at the Guillory case if he got elected. Don McKee also lobbied Dakia hard. He wanted the case prosecuted. Dakia wanted it prosecuted, too. He was on board from the get-go, McKee said. Unlike many prosecutors, Dakia wasn't afraid to take a chance. As soon as he took office, he reopened the Guillory case. Although he knew the case had problems, he wanted a jury to decide it. Dakia charged all four with second-degree murder. It was a simpler charge to prove and less costly to prosecute. The charge didn't allow for the death penalty, but it did carry a mandatory life sentence. And in Louisiana, life means life. Then he offered a deal to John Balio, who'd been in jail since his arrest in August 2001. If Balio testified against the other three, Dakia would let him plead guilty as a juvenile and recommend a sentence of juvenile life. Balio would get out of jail on his 21st birthday. Without Balio's testimony, Dakia knew he had nothing. He had to cut a deal with the devil. We tried to make the best case we could, he said. 
In July 2004, an East Feliciana jury found Philip Skipper guilty of second-degree murder. Johnny Hoyt went to trial in February 2005 and was also found guilty of second-degree murder. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Lisa Skipper Hoyt pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to the statutory maximum sentence, 40 years in prison. In exchange for his testimony, John Ballia was prosecuted as a juvenile. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to juvenile life. Additional murder charges are pending against Johnny and Lisa Hoyt in St. Helena Parish. No charges were ever filed against Amy Skipper. Both Don McKee and Sam Dakia were convinced that she played no part in Janor Guillory's murder. Nothing will ever bring Janor Guillory back. But as he reflects on the case, Dakia says he's satisfied with the outcome, satisfied that he was able to help put the people who murdered such a wonderful person where they belong, behind bars. Asked what he thinks of them, of Johnny and Lisa Hoyt and Philip Skipper, Sam Takia shakes his head. Those are some evil people, he said. <laughs>